Don't buy a pistol and then assume you're safe. Let's listen to Jeff Cooper explain why as he demonstrates different types of handguns and tells us of the five elements of practical shooting. The best personal defense is a proper state of mind. And once the uh, uh, subject knows what he, or in this case, I will be uh, modern and say he or she intends to do about defending himself, herself, or itself, uh, at that point, uh, the question of a firearm uh, does become relevant. It is very dangerous and very unsound to buy a firearm and feel that you are now safer than you were before. Well, you are now more armed because you own a firearm than you are a musician because you own a guitar. The instrument is not the answer. The skill to use it is the answer. And that's what we must teach. What kind of weapon should I choose? Listen. It is often suggested that uh, for the unpracticed hand, the double action revolver of this type is safer. That is, it's less dangerous to the user. Obviously, uh, we don't want a weapon that is safe to the intruder. But we, uh, what, there are people who maintain that this weapon is a safer weapon to have in untrained hands. I am very uneasy about that attitude because I don't like any weapon in untrained hands. Of course, I cannot change the world, so I have to accept the fact that there are people who are going to buy firearms who don't know what they're going to do with them. Now, under that very unfortunate circumstance, I would say that a double-action revolver of good quality is probably the best bet. You don't have to get them this big. They come smaller, that size. Um, this is a this is they're very definitely not even Plan B. This is Plan C. If you have to give a weapon to somebody who doesn't understand weapons, but for a person who understands weapons, the automatic pistol or semi-automatic pistol actually is uh, superior in all sorts of ways. It's uh, in the first place a lot easier to learn to shoot well because you do not have to learn to manage that double action trigger. Now, this um, is a full-size 1911, the kind that I carry most of the time and the kind that I recommend. It's um, very convenient for a person who has a stature for it, but it's a little bit big. And uh, there are people who, in the first place, don't have the body uh, mass to wear one of these things comfortably. And there are a good many people who can't make it from here to here with a hand. Um, unfortunately, there's not, not much has been done about that in recent times. Uh, I think it would be the next step, not so much the double action auto, but producing a uh, semi-automatic pistol which was shorter from here to here and narrower from here to here. We find that about half of our women students and about a quarter of our men students can't get their hands around this. So you can get a smaller weapon, such as that. The reach is still not taken out. This is a full power gun. This is a 45, but it's made out of light metals and it packs away neatly. Uh, this is a good choice. Uh, the small, the smallest of size of the weapon makes the piece a little bit harder to use. Small size and lightweight are conveniences for portability, but they do make the weapon harder to use. The lighter the weapon, the more it kicks for the same cartridge. And the smaller the weapon, the lighter it is, and uh, it, it brings out certain other disadvantages. So the matter of bulk, of size, does intrude. But uh, there is no question in my, my, my mind but what the major caliber semi-automatic pistol is the most efficient defensive device we've come up with yet. The second element, the weaver stance. The weaver stance is an essential part of the modern technique. I would say that in most cases in which you are apt to use a handgun to defend yourself, you will use the weaver stance. There are other systems, and we touch upon them. But because of the probabilities, we emphasize the weaver stance over everything else. It's impossible to speak statistically because very few people have lethal encounters. And when they do, each encounter could be an exception. But somewhere on the order of 
eight out of ten uh, defensive pistol situation called for the ruler stance. Now, the stance is the entire body, from the feet to the top of the head. But the heart of the stance is the grip. Now, anyone can call anything anything you want, but essentially, a grip is what you do with your hand. That is a stock. And if you want to call it a grip, it's all right with me. But for purposes of this instruction, that is a stock, and that is a grip. Possibly we had better take the round out of the chamber before we start playing. <clears throat> Two essentials of the grip are the centering of the hand behind the thrust of recoil and pl the placement of the hand as high as you can make it work. The pistol recoils while the projectile is still in the barrel. Not very much, but just a little bit, enough to affect your placement of your shot. Therefore, if you place your hand on the weapon in a way that is not centered, you're going to get a deflection action on discharge. If you put your hand on your pistol like that, the pistol will recoil away from the wrist. So the idea is to put the bones of the wrist in line with the barrel and the forearm in line with the, in line with the bones of the wrist. So that wherever you point, you are pointing essentially with your arm and not with a pistol barrel like this. The first point is to get it straight behind. The second point is to get it high. You don't want to grab it down here. We call that the Patagonian grip. And obviously, the lower you place your hand on the weapon, the more upward rotation there's going to be. People who complain about the recoil of a heavy pistol simply do not know how to put their hand on it. Because if you put your hand on it correctly, you don't have any problem with recoil. If the hand is placed properly on the weapon, the recoiling effect on discharge is negligible without, without regard to the charge or the size of the weapon. For example, I can fire this piece with thumb and forefinger, huh? Without any effect in here. That's just thumb and forefinger. And it uh, does away with the notion that where you should be concerned about the recoiling action of the weapon. Now, <clears throat> the hand is so placed that the pad of the hand abuts upon the, mag the uh, mainspring housing here. You don't put that back in there, you put it there. Your fingers are wherever they're most comfortable, but high enough so that the uh, second finger touches the trigger guard. The index finger <coughs> intersects the trigger so that the pad of the finger, not the, not the crease nor the tip, but the pad, touches the center of the trigger. Now, with weapons of this type, it's possible to uh, uh, obtain triggers of various lengths to suit the length of your finger. That's one of the advantages of having an old-style weapon. But uh, this one is set up for me. Now, <coughs> over here, the thumb. It is imperative that the thumb be carried on top of the safety, not below. Now, there are some who don't understand that, but I can tell you from experience that if you carry your thumb below the safety, sooner or later you're going to knock that safety on by mistake and put yourself out of the running. So don't carry your thumb under the safety. In addition, the grip is such that the knuckles of these, the thumb and the forefinger, should be horizontal. If you drop your thumb down there, you get a lack of support and a sense of tor torquing action. But the important part of it <coughs> is to make sure that the safety is always under your thumb and that you don't get in trouble that way. Obviously, if you are left-handed, you will call for a safety on the other side of the weapon. But if you're not left-handed, you do not need that because then with the left hand, you can operate that safety just as well, perhaps not just as fast, but just as well in those occasions when you've broken your right arm or taking a shot or something like that. Now, <clears throat> there is your firing grip, and it is slightly different with the revolver, so let's look at that. With the revolver, the principles are the same, although the structure of the weapon makes the actual positioning of the hand somewhat different. This is called a recoil shoulder, and 
Again, to get the weapon properly supported, you should place your hand high enough so that you can just barely see that recoil shoulder. This is working against you. Put your hand up on the weapon. Place your hand directly behind the weapon, again, so that the back strap intersects the pad of your hand here and not the fold. There. The thumb uh, can be carried either high on the latch or down there. It's optional. Uh, I've seen it done both ways and done very well. Personally, I find that with a Smith, if I carry my thumb up there, where the recoil is, uh, if the recoil is heavy, as with a 44 Magnum, I sometimes get a little bit abused in there, but that's easily corrected by putting a stock on here, which brings you back. I don't fancy uh, custom stocks on automatic pistols, but uh, revolvers sometimes call for them. These stocks are so made as to fill this gap down here so you don't have the problem of cranking your hand. When you're <coughs> with the revolver, since you're going to shoot it most of the time in the trigger cocking mode, like that, you do not put the tip of your pad of your finger on the trigger. You go all the way in to where the first crease intersects the right side. So, and your firing stroke is there. That's uh, approximately the same as with the auto. No slight differences. Since the grip is approximately the same on the revolver and the auto, I'll go ahead with the stance using the auto. The lever stance is a function of the entire body from the feet to the top of the head. And the first thing that makes it look unusual is that uh, the body is more or less square to the target. Uh, when a flag flies, it's necessary to cover as much ground with your peripheral vision as possible, so that when you're coming into an action, you want to face into it pretty much so that you can look both ways at the same time. There may be other problems. That doesn't mean you square your feet exactly. Most people find that they're a little bit more comfortable by dropping the right foot back slightly. Obviously, this is for a right-hander. But don't drop it back to there. That makes you unstable and makes it difficult for you to ass uh, address targets on your left. You are, in effect, denying your left side. And remember that these techniques are not range techniques. They are street techniques. And you don't know what type of a situation you're getting into. Now, we've showed you the grip. Here's the grip. The stance, so note that the feet are planted uh, squarely, about a, a half step apart. The knees are straight, the hips are level, the shoulder is level, the head is erect. Clearly, there are variations upon this, but I'm showing you the system which we suggest first. If you find that anatomical differences make it necessary for you to modify it for your purposes, OK. Now, I'm going to point in that direction, because I have a prejudice against uh, uh, pointing at the camera. There is the stance. Note that the arm is extended from the right shoulder. The right arm is as straight as you can get it, or slightly bent. We, I personally favor a slightly bent right arm, because it's stronger. But there are very good shots who shoot with a straight arm. The, uh, Inventor of the stance, however, Jack Weaver, always shot with a slightly bent arm, and I do. I favor it somewhat. <clears throat> so let's bring it down to about there. But don't let the elbow flex out to the side. That'll in involve a problem here of lack of support against recoil. You want to shoot right down your forearm in such a fashion. Keep your head up. Do not bring your head down to your pistol. Bring your pistol up to your head. It's easier on your muscles. You will use both eyes if you can. If you're fortunate enough to have one eye which is distinctly master, leave both eyes open and allow nature to take its course. Here I am shooting with my right eye, and now I'm shooting with my left eye. That's all the difference I have to make. So whether you are right or left eyed is unimportant. Either one will do shooting with the right arm. If, on the other hand, your eyes are not master, that is, they're about the same, and that happens, then it probably is a good idea for you to dim your left eye slightly. I have to do this because I am slightly left-eyed, not very much, but it's easier and it's a better teaching technique for me to shoot right-handed with the right eye. So I slightly dim my left eye. But by choice, you'll use both eyes at once. Now, with your head up and your hand there, what do you do with your left hand? So the left hand is placed on the weapon Vertical, with a palm vertical and a thumb up. It clasps the, the pistol with 
uh, with the uh, two hands clapping together. Do not allow the left hand to come down here. This is called palming it. And of course, if you want to uh, get fancy, you can use one of the uh, cinematographic things where you shoot like this. This is very good. Now, the uh, answer is to keep your hands together and to keep the fingers together and the thumb high. Now, the index finger. Uh, many expert shots carry the index finger forward there, and we don't insist that you do not. However, our teachings here have uh, established pretty well that you have better recoil control when your hand is underneath the trigger guard for the obvious reason, you see. The pistol tends to rotate here, and if you put your hand there, you have more leverage against damping it. The, uh, uh, it's optional, but uh, we suggest you try this system first. The right thumb is on the safety, so, and the left thumb, by choice, is placed on top of the right thumb. There are those, again, who carry the thumb down here, but you want to watch that. There's a tendency there to get, operate that safety inadvertently. It's, it gets worse if you get one of these <coughs> elaborate extended side stops. Then if you carry your thumb down there, you'll lock the action open without a tendency. <coughs> now, but the essence of the Weaver stance is the isometric push-pull between the right hand and the left. That's what makes it weaver as opposed to any other two-handed stance. You push with the right and you pull with the left. The pressure in here builds you into a tank turret so that the pistol itself represents the gun, the hands, the mantlet, the mounting system, and the shoulders, the turret itself. So in a proper weaver stance, you can, can change your action this way without ever flexing anything in here. It's important in your training to remember that you do not let your wrists and elbows flex. If you do that, every time you take a firing position, you're going to have to find it again. In your hunting or ready position down here with your thumb on the safety and the finger straight, if you want to go on target, note that the angle of my wrist is not going to change. Like that. If you do this, you have to find it again. You have unlocked yourself. Marksmanship is essentially a matter of program reflexes. And if you concentrate heavily on programming your reflexes, you can pick up very good technique in a very short time. If you have to find yourself every time you start again, it'll take you years to learn this. This way we can do it in a week or so. So, remember that your position here remains constant. There's your firing stance, there's your rest stance. So that's the only difference is that you pivot it from the shoulders and put your elbow against your side. This is your rest stance, and this is your covering stance. If you are expecting trouble, you stand this way with your finger straight. Remember, you don't put your finger on the trigger until your sights are on the target, and your safety on. If you take a blow in this position, if something hits you, you won't have an accidental discharge. And you cannot move any faster than that. So you are not slowing yourself down in that situation. The Weaver stance is going to do the job for you most of the time. Later on in the course, we'll show you a couple of different systems which might come up in various types of emergencies. For beginning exercises, we will start here in the ready position. We will start with the firing grip achieved with both hands, eyes on the target, fingers straight, thumb on the safety. As we say up, the safety stays behind like that. The finger finds the trigger, takes out the slack, and we shift our focus from the target to the front sight and let the hammer fall. Immediately, the finger goes straight, let the thumb cock the pistol, safety goes on, and we come back to here again. Again, up, look, press, down. And without the count, it's simply, ready, fire, down. With a revolver, it's not quite the same. The revolver, it's similar, except that we start with the finger on the trigger because the double action mode of the revolver calls for it. As the pistol rises into position and the eye shifts focus, the hammer starts back, and the alignment line up and goes. We start here, and as we come up, we shift the eye to the front sight, and we time it so that as the eye picks up the front sight, the hammer has reached the rearward portion of its stroke, and we allow the action to proceed. Ready? Go. And again, ready, go. If you raise your pistol to here, your revolver, and crank through like that, there's a strong tendency to clinch. You should time it so that you work the hammer on the way up. 
Remember, we are using full power weapons here. We make no foolishness about reduced charges for target shooting or light loads or uh, muzzle compensators and so on. We're using a full house blow, a fight stopping blow that delivers a little recoil. You control it by proper use of your hands and it doesn't need to bother you at all. You can always check a, uh, uh, an experienced shot because his weapon doesn't move, almost it doesn't move at all on discharge. Whereas the duffer lets it go. Uh, for example, if I were to fire here with the wrong tension in my hand, uh, you might see something like this. Now, this is not the way to do it. I'm showing it to you wrong. That's wrong. When you put your hands together properly, you look like this. And the pistol moves no more than a half an inch. And that's not a question of bulk or weightlifting. That's just a question of knowledge, knowing where to put your hands and how to use them. The third element. What is the flash sight picture? You often hear it said that you don't use the sights in combat. Well, some people don't. They miss a lot, too. Uh, I've heard people analyze the studies of the New York PD and say, well, since we find that 67.381 of police officers who fire at felons don't see the sights, we think we better teach you not to use the sights because that's what you're going to do. I get very much annoyed when people tell me how to do things wrong. The fact that Nine out of ten people do it wrong doesn't mean you should do it wrong. And yet we have this terrible drive for equality or something. So if everybody's going to be a klutz, let's all be klutzes. Huh? Well, that's not the answer. I have a perfect example of this. I once uh, was told that the uh, hit score in, in New York was 11%. And I wrote it down. I thought my authority was good. And somebody called me up in a rage from New York and said, what do you mean 11 percent? Why our hit score last year was 16 percent? Oh, well, pardon me all to hell. I, <laughs> I, what I was talking about was 100 percent. Now, I can say this with some accuracy, though I, it's not perfect, but as you understand that, that not everybody who has been to school here and who has subsequently got into a fight has written me about it. But most have. It's my stock and trade. I need that information. And most people, regard, we regard ourselves as friends, and if they get into a fight, they tell me about it. If their reports are true, the average, the, the hit score of gunsight graduates is 100%. Not 11, not 16. Therein hangs the tale, huh? So, we use the sights, and we use the sights always. We even use the sights when we can't see them. Now, that may sound uh, paradoxical to you, but we'll show you that on Thursday night. You use the sights. When the flag flies, for not just marksmanship reasons, but for metal concentration and other things, when the flag flies, the thing that flashes in your head is front sight. Up to that point, you may have been talking, gee, am I in trouble? Am I going to have to shoot my way out of this? Who are those guys? What happens if I win? What happens if I lose? All that may be flashing through your mind. But once you decide to go, Front sight in your mind. Now, what do we mean by a sight picture? A sight picture is illustrated in the books this way. I want to see. It's getting spastic today. With a square front post and a bullseye and a square rear sight. Now, that's the kind of sights most of us have. Square, square, square. But it's quite obvious that you can't see this, this, and this in the same focus because they're a different distance from your eye. Now, with a um, pistol, the sights are so close together so that when you're out there, the difference in focus between there and there is not very great. But the difference between there and there is great. You cannot focus on the target and focus on the front sight at the same time. It is not physiologically possible. So since you can't see them both. What do you look at? Well, you let the target fur itself out, and you look at that. Remember that it's essential to focus on your front sight and not on the target. Watch while the camera changes focus. Focus out 
Now you see you're looking at the target. It is not what you do when you shoot. When you shoot, you look at your front sight. Focus in. Got that? Focus out. Focus in. When the action starts, you will be looking at your adversary. As your pistol comes on the line, you must remember to change your focus to the front sight. Focus in. Focus out. Focus in. That is your shooting picture. Now that is your, your sight picture. Now what do we mean by a flash sight picture? A flash sight picture means an instantaneous pickup. The, practically, the uh, target shot does this. He picks up his target out there, he aligns his sights very carefully, and he gently presses the trigger until at such point when it's right on, he's got a 10. A combat shot can't do that. He hasn't got that much time. A combat shot starts either in the holster or in combat ready. And he says, up, sit, down. Now that's a flash sight picture. You have to get used to the idea that you can pick up your front sight and its alignment with the rear sight like that. So that this, this evening, after we've done some shooting this way, your homework will be just that. It'll be down here, thumb on the safety, fingers straight, eyes on the target. Okay, as you come up, safety stays behind, slack comes out of the trigger, eye goes to there, and when you're on, and come down. Don't wait. As soon as you can pick up that front side, let it go. Up, look, press down. And that's the way you achieve a, a flash sight picture. And you'll do that tonight until you learn that you can never do it any other way. And then we can go on to higher and nobler things tomorrow. The fourth element, the compressed surprise break. A surprise break is this. I start the pressure between here and here, and I just increase it. And very gently, I increase it. And sooner or later, sometime before the sun goes down, something's going to happen there. But that's going to happen. But I didn't know. I didn't know when. That was a surprise break. There are three trigger control systems that can be used in marksmanship. One is the open end surprise break, which I just showed you. The other is the compressed surprise break. And the third is the nudge, which we will not discuss in this te text because it doesn't apply. But the combat shooter uses the compressed surprise break. Instead of saying, any time, any time, hmm, it went, didn't it? Uh, instead of saying any time, you say this. You say sometime between now and now. And it's a dial. Maybe it's take a five second stroke, huh? One, two, three, four, five. Now what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna take the slack out. Notice you always do that. There's always slack in an automatic trigger. So you take that out and you start there. Now, when the slack is taken out, you start the pressure in such a way that sometime before five it's gonna go. One, two, three, four. Didn't make it to five. But I didn't know when that was going to happen. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. All of those surprised me. I didn't know the exact instant. Now, when you learn this, you pick up your speed. You say, one, two, three. You say, one, two. You say, one, two. But every time, that was a surprise. I never got on the thing and said, go. If you get on the target and say, go, you've got a real bad problem and we hope we can save you. <laughs> yeah, a million dollar flinch. Actually, we don't use the term flinch around here. Uh, it implies uh, uh, some things we don't really mean to suggest, but we call it pushing or leaning on the shot. You get out there and you say, there it is. You want to help that round, you go, Ugh! You don't need to help that round. It will take care of itself. You must write, think of yourself as a carrier deck. You don't jump off the carrier deck. You say, take off. You hold the carrier deck level, and the airplane takes off. So in this case, you say, let it happen. Don't force it. Let it happen. And that is a compressed surprise break. Now, I mentioned that those of you who can't see the front sight will be half of the people who have trouble with this class. The other half will be the people who can't surprise themselves with that break. And I can say this. Firing in action is a little bit easier than firing on the range. Because in action, you know that you have to make it work. So in my own case, and my um, action record is better than most, 
I have always made an issue of saying when there's blood out there, either a, uh, a, a dangerous animal or a human adversary, is front sight and let it surprise you. You'd be surprised how quick that happens. In other words, you don't say, you're not waiting around. The guy may be shooting at you. Or maybe this lion is coming right at your muzzle, but you say, front sight, let it surprise you. Like that, and you got him. And all is well. If you get out there and start leaning on him, you've lost the game. But it's easier in the field because you can tell how important it is. And the secret of successful sh field shooting is to tell yourself on each occasion that this is the only shot in the world that ever mattered. This is the William Tell shot. This is the apple on your son's head. This shot, now. And only thus can you get the proper concentration to put this thing together. Concentration is what marksmanship is. Or you could say concentration and self-control. Element number five, the presentation. What is the proper way for me to present my weapon? Nothing about drawing the pistol is dangerous if the person doing it knows how to do it. But there are people who don't know how, and consequently you hear of leg shots and other forms of accidents. They only happen to people who haven't been educated. Now, with the auto pistol, the technique is similar, but not quite the same as a revolver. I will show it to you with the auto pistol. The pistol is normally carried on the belt in condition one with the hammer back and the safety on. Now, to uh, avoid trouble, I always look first before I check. Let the press check to show you that there's no shell mechanism. Now, we will start on the assumption that this is not going to go off. On the count of one, or grip, you move your right hand to your pistol and your left hand to a grab position at the same count. Your right hand unlatches any sort of retaining device as the grip is achieved. And it's very important to achieve a full firing grip so that you don't have to move anything after your pistol starts out. Starting the pistol out this way and grabbing it is the wrong way. Now, it's very important as a time saver to move your left hand at the same time you move your right. So on the first stroke, which is uh, grip, you do that. Now, you can practice that for the rest of your life and it'll be to your advantage because you never want to miss your draw. And you only program this reflex by repetition. And of course, you don't have to go shooting to do it. You can do this in your bedroom. In any case, grip. The second count is clear. On the second count, all that happens is the pistol is removed from the holster and nothing else. It comes to there. If you do not operate the safety, you do not put your finger on the trigger. Grip. Clear. Those are the first two. Now, on the third count, the pistol is moved halfway from the holster to the left hand, and the safety comes off. And on the range, we like to hear it, so we call this count click. This is different, of course, from the technique of the revolver. Grip, clear, click. Now, at the click position, you can verify your arm, verify the position of your hand, that everything is straight. You do not put your finger on the trigger. See, your pistol is here, halfway to your left hand. Your safety has come off now. But you have not put your finger on the trigger because that comes next. Again, grip, clear, click. The next count is smack. You want to hear the hands come together. Smack. And at that point, with the auto pistol, your finger enters the trigger guard. Not until then. You see, you could get in trouble if you got out of time. But you're not going to get out of time. Now, in this position, all the way up to now, you kept your eyes on the target and your left elbow against your side. You have put your finger on the trigger, but you have not taken out the slack. So, again, grip, clear, click, smack. Now, a lot of things happen. The last count is look, and that calls your attention to your front sight. So, you force your left arm away from your body with your right, come up the line, take the slack out of the trigger, and change your focus to the front sight and stop. Even at maximum speed, you stop for a microsecond. You must stop at the top of the stroke, otherwise your shot will go over your target. So, grip, clear, click, smack, look. Now you're ready to go and let the hammer fall. So, the whole the full stroke is grip, clear, click, smack, look, press. And when you do it correctly, of course, you don't do it staccato. You don't do it by bumps. You do it smoothly in this fashion. 
Ready? Go. Rip, clear, click, smack, look, press. And that's the way you get a hit. Now, it's very important that you do that for smoothing. Get smooth. Smooth is the ultimate aim. Smoothness, not speed. As soon as you're smooth and those actions take place in proper sequence, then there's no problem and you're going fast. But don't go for speed until you have smoothness. Smooth is fast.